I'm Father Mitch Pacwa, and welcome to EWTN Live. This is a show where we bring you guests from around the world, and our guest tonight is here to shed light on the church's teaching on a number of current societal problems and issues. Issues that Christians are coming up against more and more, whether in the workplace, in schools, at home, in government, in the media, and in conversations with acquaintances. These societal issues include abortion, immigration, homosexuality, critical race theory, and other topics. And these are subjects that we Christians desperately need the wisdom of Jesus Christ and the guidance of his church to properly discern and interpret so that we can keep ourselves within the will of God. Now, our guest tonight is a moral theologian. He's also the pastor of Our Lady of Grace Parish in Indian Land, South Carolina. He is a papal missionary of mercy and an adjunct professor of theology at Belmont Abbey College. He's the author of several books on spiritual and pastoral topics, including Sanctify Them in Truth, How the Church's Social Doctrine Addresses the Issues of Our Time. So please welcome Father Jeffrey Kirby. Father Kirby, welcome. Thank good you, to Father. have you. Yeah, it's good to be here. Good to have you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you for writing this uh, very clear and important book. You mm. take on some of the very difficult issues of our time, some of which are, you know, primarily issues of right and wrong, and others are questions that we have to look at with prudence, good judgment, and weighing the facts, you yeah. know, and this is, and you help to make those distinctions, so I, I appreciate that. Tell us, first of all, why did you write this book and take this approach? Yeah, so as you mentioned in the intro, uh, not only am I a moral theologian, but also uh, a pastor. So I, I'm right there in the trenches with, with families, with Christian parents, uh, with disciples of Jesus Christ who are trying to figure out, what do I do in this situation? And so oftentimes mm -hmm. sure. people have just been crying out for guidance, help me, mm -hmm. talk about this, please, give some type of wisdom explanation. So really it was the cries of the people of God for help, for yes. clarification, for teaching, mm -hmm. that eventually led to actually a homily series, that eventually led to a full uh, adult formation program. And if you could imagine, Father, having about 300 Catholic adults come on a weekly basis at a parish for adult formation, you know as well as I do, that doesn't happen very often. No, not very often. And, and that's what the reality was. We had some 300 people for nine weeks straight. People were coming because he just wanted to hear what, what does the church teach about this, about LGBTQ plus movement, about critical race theory, about gender equality, and all these issues that we have very clear teachings, things that can help people in, in, in terms of their discipleship. So really it was just the petition of God's people for answers and clarity that eventually led to these different programs that eventually led uh, to this book. And so far the book has been very widely received. People are saying thank you for just talking about this. So I think that we definitely can recognize a need and a desire among God's people for, for this type of teaching and explanation. Sure. Now, we mentioned some of the topics you address. Um, some of the issues uh, deal with uh, beginning of life yes. and death issues, and others deal with human sexuality. Uh, these are some of the most controversial topics in our society. Why don't we begin with some of those yes. uh, before we go to some issues like immigration and such. Yeah, so let's go to the, the first moral issue uh, in terms of life, in terms of uh, social questions, and, and of course that's the question uh, of abortion. And, and it literally is the chronologically first issue, right? Yeah. In, in the sense of if we don't get this right, we have no moral credibility, no, no foundation to argue anything else. We mm -hmm. can't argue about war or torture or poverty if we're not first talking about life at the very beginning. So we have to go to that 
preeminent issue of abortion. And Mother Church uses this term, preeminent issue, which means it's the first of all life issues, it's the first of all social issues, it's first, not only chronologically, although that too, but also in terms of prominence that this is the issue where life is the most vulnerable. It's at the very beginning. Uh, the child is what should be the safest place in the world, the, the, the womb of its mother, mm -hmm. you know, and then also the ones who are the accomplices to this act of violence are the medical professionals who are sworn to protect life. So mm -hmm. you can see multiple attacks in terms of trust, sacred duty, in terms of dignity. Mm -hmm. So Mother Church right away would immediately go to abortion. And then, of course, as you indicated, Father, then we go to the end of life, which is, of course, euthanasia, uh, physician-assisted suicide. These are the two stages, the two times in which life is the most vulnerable. It is easy to beat up on people because they cannot protect themselves. Right. So whether it's the child in the womb or whether it's uh, the person who is seriously ill or uh, who has somehow given up on life and thinks that, therefore, life, their life should be concluded. And again, the doctor becomes the accomplice. So in areas of euthanasia, again, we're talking about vulnerable life where in a civilized society, the vulnerable would be see as, seen as blessings and opportunities for service, mm -hmm. rather than what we hear in today's culture, which is these are burdens that must be destroyed. As Christians, we have to be very careful of this language and this gas that is just constantly throughout our society. I remember a social studies, uh, a, a, a social study on cultures that treated children uh, with harshness, for instance, Sparta, which mm -hmm. if you had any defects, they put, exposed the baby to be eaten by animals. That was also done in Rome and a number of other societies. And those societies that exposed their children uh, to being destroyed tended to be more violent societies. And it's no accident that in the first year after Roe versus Wade, yep. the murder rate for children five years old and under went up by 100% in one year. That's right. Yep. And Mother Teresa made the same observation uh, during her one of her visits to the United States where she said, basically, if you want to know why there's this violence among young people, why we have school shootings and so on, is if you tell a mother that she can, st you know, she can kill her own child, and you tell the younger generation that it's okay f that we slaughtered their siblings, then there's no moral standing. We can't argue anything when this culture of violence then takes over. Mm -hmm. So we see this violence begets violence. Darkness speaks to darkness. Mm -hmm. So we shouldn't be surprised. But you know, th this leads to one of the biggest scenes that we can see the situations, which is we've convinced ourselves in our culture that we can do evil and there are no consequences. And we can do evil and call it mercy. Just yes. last week on a, a talk show on a secular network, a woman said to these other ladies that um, we have to call abortion what it really is, an act of mercy. Yeah. Wow. And they try to call euthanasia mercy killing. Yes. It is an evil notion, so inspired by evil, to call a, 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 an act of murder mercy. That's right. And, and we see this redefinition. Uh, we can call it an inversion of words. So words become redefined. And there are words that we recognize. Historically, there are words as Christians, mercy, mm -hmm. love, freedom, and so on. And yet they've been redefined because they appeal to the human heart, right? So yeah. we hear mercy, we hear love. These are things that build us up, that raise our hearts. We are naturally inclined to them. So they use this attraction and then they redefine the words to disguise evil. So and as we know from the scriptures, that evil is called good, good is called evil. I think one of the observations we see from spiritual writers today is that a dark age is not when the lights go out. <laughs> a dark age is when the lights go out and no one notices. Mm -hmm. And when we begin to forget what is good and what is evil. Now, to the unbeliever in our secular society, that becomes understandable. For the Christian disciple who has the grace of God and is consecrated to Jesus Christ and the help of the church, there are no excuses. Yeah. So as I oftentimes tell adults, you have to know your faith. Say, so, oh, why was not taught this when I was a child? The nuns never taught this to us. How old were you when you were taught by the nuns? What were you, fourth grade, sixth grade? How old are you now? Seventy-five. 
Right. I think you. <laughs> how did you, you learn? had some time to look it up. Exactly. The nuns didn't teach you how to play golf, but you figured it out, right? So when it comes to your faith, and you need to be a little more proactive and realize that this is the most important thing you're going to get right. And so you need to be a little more active, a little more intentional. You need to invest more because we have to know our faith. And, and the church gives clear answers. This is something that's extremely important that you didn't stop learning how to use a computer when you were in grammar school. Yes. We didn't have computers <laughs> when I was in grammar school. Right, right. But, you know, you, you don't stop learning vocabulary, all sorts of things. Why would you stop learning about your faith and moral thinking? And one of the points that you make throughout your book is that you constantly go back to both scripture and the catechism of That's the church. Right. This is not something that you're just saying, this is my personal bailiwick, my personal opinion. This is what the church officially teaches. teaches. Yes, yes. And to be in line with the church, yes. we have to know this teaching and understand how we deal with it. And Father, I'm glad you, you made that point because and I want to emphasize that uh, to, to those uh, who are seeking to know their faith that in my book, as you indicated, I restricted myself to the scriptures and the catechism of the Catholic Church. I didn't go into massive encyclicals or Vatican instructions and debates about what are the authority of what documents and so on and so on. That has its place, but not in a book like this. I, mm -hmm. I wanted this book to be easy to read, accessible, yep. digestible. It is. So I, I just chose the scriptures and the catechism of the Catholic Church. And anyone can be challenged by this book and then go to those sources and look for themselves. And I will say this as well, just, just to throw this piece in here that in, in terms of the times we live in, uh, church leaders come and go, good leaders come and go, bad leaders come and go. And the one thing that remains are the immutable teachings of Jesus Christ. Yes. And that is what we get from the scriptures and the catechism of the Catholic Church. So sometimes people can be confused by opinions or public statements of church leaders. And I'd say, Okay, listen, however they might be worth or not worth your attention, but then go to the scriptures and go to the catechism of the Catholic Church. I argue that every Christian home should have the scriptures and a copy of the catechism of the Catholic Church. Absolutely. The Word of God uh, written and the Word of God by oral tradition. So the catechism of the Catholic Church for the baptized is one of the easiest, uh, most accessible monuments of sacred tradition that, that they can have in their homes. So go to the sources, right? If a, if a church leader is, is shocking you or some theologian has made some comment or some organization or something has been said from the, the pulpit of your parish church, okay, fine. But go to the catechism and go to the scriptures because there you will find the clear teachings of the church in spite of or around whatever church leaders we might have. Yeah. I think uh, I'd like to go to some of the other issues mm. that... Uh, in some ways seem a bit newer. Mm -hmm. there, there are issues in the modern times, yeah. such as dealing with sexual identity. Yes. You address those. Tell, tell us how you approach those yes. questions. Yeah, and I'll tell you honestly, Father, um, my heart goes out to any family or neighborhood that is struggling or trying to answer questions with transgenderism, mm -hmm. because this becomes a, a harder situation because we're dealing with even, we mentioned language, uh, even in terms of direct address, in terms of pronouns and how people are, are, are addressed, in terms of names or pronouns and various mm -hmm. things, it becomes far harder. And in fact, I've made the argument that one of the greatest moral issues of our day in terms of, of the pressing nature uh, is actually transgenderism because within this one movement, what we find is confusion in terms of human personhood, <laughs> human sexuality, gender, the understanding of marriage, the understanding of, of human dignity, and so on, and, and the list goes on. In, in many respects, this movement has become a microcosm of everything else that we've been battling in terms of moral truth. And so we have people who have mental illness who need attention and care in order to address this mental illness, and yet are told, no, no, it's okay that you, that you think this, that you are one gender, observably and biologically, and yet, no, it's okay. We are going to play the game, our society tells us, tells those who are struggling with this. We're going to play this game and allow you to think that you're actually this other gender, and we're all going to call you by a different name and a different pronoun, and so on. And then we act shocked when we see the suicide rate among this particular movement, because ultimately it's a mental illness. We have to speak truth in love, so we try to address it. We let the person understand that 
it's a fallen world. People have disorders and, and, and problems left and right. Uh, this is one that, that they have and that they need to seek help in order to understand and become comfortable with themselves. So this, this one movement becomes very aggressive. And, and in terms of the LGBTQ plus movement, which you know, encapsulates almost all of this, uh, this is now becoming the driving force. It used to be the gay movement, but now within this overall movement, it's a transgender movement that's pushing this. And what we find are assaults in terms of neighborhoods, public uh, places, uh, churches even. We find uh, this also in terms of youth sports. We find it in homeowners associations. I mean, when the people of God are reaching out and saying, um, the neighbors across the street, um, the husband now says he's a woman and they're having a slumber party. Can our kids go over for the slumber party? Because this is very peculiar, right? Mm -hmm. And they're asking for clarification and guidance. And this is where, like, prudentially we can draw from the church's teaching and say yes or no. Mm -hmm. well, how would we approach it then? Yes. How, what, in your work here, how do we approach that kind of situation? Yes, yes. So I, I would say let's go back to the early church. And what do we see with our forebears in terms of the faith? Well, the early Christians, uh, Rome and Roman civilization thought that they were peculiar because they refused to participate in the games because they were violent and oftentimes led to death. Uh, they would not participate in the bacchanalia, which are basically orgies. Mm -hmm. So the Christians removed themselves from public events that violated human dignity, violated love, violated the more teachings of God. And so oftentimes Christians were con approached with suspicion because, you know, especially in, in the ancient world, you were defined by your participation in the community. Right. And so Christians would absent themselves because they could not be a part of it. They would be accomplices to evil and, and it would show a support. So if this is the legacy we've received, this is the moral witness we've inherited as Christians, then I would say we look at the world today and there are times in which, yes, we are still called to go out in the midst of the world, to share the good news, to be salt, light, and leaven. But there are times where I would say all of us, and especially Christian parents, have to draw the line. So, for example, in this case, no, your child should not participate in a slumber party where one of the host parents uh, is transgender. Like, no, like you should not subject your child to that type of confusion. Let us just give some other examples that have come up that led to the book and sure. the other programs. At work, there's a party at lunch for a colleague who has, quote, married another man, a man who's married another man, supposedly, right? So they have this party at lunch. Well, they don't have the party for all the heterosexuals who have gotten married in that workplace, but they have this party and everyone's expected to go. So can the Catholic Christian attend this party at lunch? And of course the Catholic Christian saying, well, what is my boss gonna think if I don't go? What are my, my, my coworkers gonna think? What are they gonna call me behind my back or to my face, right? Because a movement that speaks of tolerance is extremely intolerant, right? I mean, they call us terrible names. Uh, you know, uh, both to our face and, and, and behind our backs and then, of course, to our church. So in this situation, can the Catholic Christian go? No, we cannot participate in anything that would normalize any type of deviant behavior, any type of sinful behavior, right? Here's what the gay movement has convinced us, is that homosexual attraction, we are falsely told, homosexual attraction is just a parallel love that a man has for another man. So if one man loves a woman, well now here's this parallel where this man loves another man, right? Uh, sexually and so on. And we've accepted this and that's the great normalization as opposed to, no, no, this is not a parallel love. There's a love that a man has for a woman and then there is the deviant love that a man has for his male friend. And this is a deviant love, a disordered love. So it's not a parallel love. It's not, you know, there's no normalization here mm -hmm. between the two. And I would say, and I make this argument as pastorally and as clear as I can in the book, that that is the real task. Because someone can easily say, oh, but, it, you know, it's just a slumber party. You know, it, it's just a piece of cake at lunch. It's, you know, and, and so on. And, and it's okay. Well, well, you know what? It was just pork for the Maccabees, right? It was just a piece of incense before the image of, our, of the emperor for our forebears, right? Simple acts, it would seem, that mean disobedience and ultimately denial of moral truth and, and uh, of um, right religion. So I would say that it's time for Christians to begin to say, I will not participate in this. I, I will not normalize this. I will not be an accomplice to this. I, I will speak the truth in love. I will continue to share the gospel. I will continue to serve. As Christians, we hate no one. 
It's love that compels us to say, I'm not going to normalize what hurts you, hurts your soul, hurts hurt your relationship with God. So we have to draw the line. And, and well, one of the things that you also do in your book, you include not only laying out of the principles of how we determine right and wrong, but you also include an examination of conscience right. regarding each issue. Yes. And we have to examine our own conscience, make sure, because we know that this, that certain you know, sexual acts are inherently disordered. That's right. You also make sure that we examine our conscience that we don't reject or hate these people. Never would we condone any kind of violence mm, exactly. or, or, or any kind of uh, oppression to them because they may have a disordered That's right. uh, love. But neither will we say that it's okay neither one of those is good behavior. That's right. And that we have to make sure that we tell folks around us that you cannot attack or harm people because of what's going on with them sexually. Yes. But at the same time, neither can we condone it. Exactly. And Father, I want to emphasize um, some of the language you're using that's, that's very helpful. So we speak of disordered love. We speak of disordered affection. It is very important as Christians that we understand that human beings are not disordered. So there is no disordered human being. There are children of God. There are disordered affections. There's disordered attractions, disordered love, as, as you have been using these terms. Mm -hmm. And it's important that we use that because when we use the term disorder, everyone gets uncomfortable. Well, you know, I can have a disordered love for food or disordered love for, you know, whatever. I mean, we, we use this term constantly in our moral tradition. So when we speak of a moral, a disordered attraction or disordered love, uh, this is just part of living in a fallen world. Mm -hmm. and in this case, it happens to be, okay, this is applied to same-sex attraction, which means the person has to acknowledge that. Now, I say that because once we make the distinction that there's not a disordered person, right, there are disordered affections and love and so on, then what happens is we can recognize the dignity of every human person. And this goes to your point, Father, which yes. is, you know, I say when I preach on these matters, as Christians, we are not permitted to hate anyone. And if anyone were to attempt to harm another person, as a Christian, I will be the first to defend that person, even if that person is my enemy, even right. if that is, that is the right. person who's calling me horrible names. As a Christian, I am bound to protect the dignity of another. This is why we protect the unborn. This is why we protect the vulnerable. This is why we protect those with special needs. This is why if someone attacks another human being, as a Christian, we seek to protect that person. Right. So absolutely, and, and to emphasize <laughs> vehemently, as Christians, like we do not hate, we do not cause violence. We speak the truth, we speak the truth in love because it's very important that the person understands what will bring peace, what will allow for true love, what will grant harmony in terms of our relationship with one another. Yeah, and the relationship with God our Lord. Amen, yes. These issues that have to deal with the beginning of life that tend to be about sexuality and the... Um, role of abortion and end of life and family. Mm -hmm. These issues have principles within human nature. Yes. This is, this is hardwired into human nature. But then there are other issues that you bring up that are not part of human nature, but of the various kinds of situations we find the modern world in. I would mention as an example, what you write in regard to immigration. Right. Immigration is not an issue in say nomadic areas of, of the world. Nomads don't have uh, borders, but nations do. And so we have new problems. Talk about how we approach Yes. The immigration, because this is a, a very, very big concern right now. Yes, yes. You know, Father, as you mentioned, uh, each chapter of the book begins with a virtue and a principle from our social doctrine. A and I quote the catechism. So this isn't my definition. I, I, I'm not trying to say, oh, this is what, how, we, how we should understand this virtue. 
but I give a virtue and I give a, a principle from our social doctrine, again with citations from the Catechism of the Catholic Church, in order to help us to think as believers as we approach these moral issues. Otherwise, we end up trying to speak with the language of the unbelievers in a secular world about moral truth. That's not helpful. No. So we have to begin with what are our understanding, what is the objective understanding of virtue and moral principles. Once we have that, then we can make this distinction that, that, that you're pointing us to, which is there are moral issues that are absolute and there are moral issues that are prudential. And this important and by is very prudential, important. prudential, what do you mean? Exactly. Okay, so let's go to the virtue of prudence. So the Catechism of the Catholic Church tells us that prudence assesses a situation and looks for what is the greatest good. Now, let me clarify. That does not mean the greatest beneficial to me. Right? I don't look and say, what's the best you know, for me? What do what's I the... get out of it? Exactly. It's what is the best morally good in this situation, which sometimes may require sacrifice on our parts. So there are prudential moral issues. And that distinction is so important because oftentimes what we hear from some more uh, liberal-leaning theologians within our tradition is, oh, well, you support uh, the unborn, but what are you doing about people uh, on the border? You know, what, what about immigration? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, now they're comparing apples and oranges, and mm -hmm. they know as trained theologians that they're doing this, that they're comparing apples and oranges within our moral tradition. So there are absolute issues, for example, abortion, euthanasia, issues of sexuality, that are clear. As yeah, the church would and, and you say. see them in the commandments: Thou shalt not exactly. kill. Exactly. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Yes. Thou shalt not steal. That's thou shalt it. not bear false witness. Yep. And our moral tradition calls them intrinsically evil, which means there is no circumstance or intention that could ever justify them. Mm -hmm. So it's clear. It's absolute, yeah. right? Okay. And your Those name is not on a list of exception clauses about <laughs> Thou shalt not commit adultery. Your name's not there. Right, exactly, exactly, <laughs> in light of what your heart might think or, or feel, right? So we have these absolute issues, so for example, abortion, euthanasia, and so on. Um, but then we have prudential issues, so we're speaking about immigration. This can shock people that the church's moral teachings can be applied to laws and public policy of immigration, and believers can reasonably disagree on what should be the laws or the public policies, and both can be within the church's teachings yes. on moral issues and on the moral issue of immigration. Because here it's a prudential issue, it's assessing, and there can be disagreements. I think this is the best, greatest good. I think this is the greatest good. I think this. And if you look at the Catechism of the Catholic Church, what do we find? Very interestingly, the number one responsibility of the public authority, as is determining immigration, is the well-being of the citizens under its care. Mm -hmm. Now that's very important because, well, but what about the people in other countries? Okay, these are people that we have to be worried about as well and concerned about through, through solidarity as, as, as Catholic Christians. But then subsidiarity, this is a principle of our social doctrine, kicks in, which is, okay, yes, I have to have a heart for all, but subsidiarity says I have to pay attention to the people that are right here in front of me, my family, my neighborhood, and by extension, my nation. So I have to take care of the people first that are here. And then I try to provide whatever help I can to the rest. You can imagine a husband and father coming home saying, I'm sorry kids, you don't have anything to eat, but the family down the street that's struggling, they've got some really good groceries <laughs> that I gave them. Say, <laughs> right? like, what is wrong with you? No, you feed your family first, right? right. And then as you're able, and, and sometimes you can sacrifice in order to provide food sure. you know, to your neighbors who are in need. So with immigration, there can be very different understandings of laws, of what should be uh, the, the level of, of legal immigrants, what should be the approach to illegal immigrants, and so on. And again, in prudential issues, you can have very devout, strong Catholics who can disagree, and both can be within the church's moral teachings. Yeah, they'll be looking at, you know, different, um, you know, parts of the issue. That's, that's one of the advantages of living in a democracy. You can take and look at the information and try to work with the information you have back and forth and think through what's going to help your nation and these immigrants yes. to the best of our ability, yes. given the limitations of our resources. Absolutely. Uh, no matter yes. where you live, you have limited resources. What can you use for what? Exactly. Th these, are, these are questions of thinking, yes. reason, prudence. Yes. That's key. I uh, just want to make mention that you 
recently joined with Karen Schmugi, oh, yes. who is a regional coordinator for the National Association of Catholic Family Life Ministers. She's also a Catholic Medical Association member. And together, y'all did an EWTN original five-part mini-series. Oh, yes. This is based on your book, Sanctify Them in Truth. Yes. Uh, the series is called Living the Christian Way, and this will be seen on EWTN all next week, Monday through Friday, November 14th to the 19th at 5.30 p.m. We urge you to get a hold of Father's book as well as looking at this series as a way to help ourselves to learn how to think. It's not just this is what you do, this is what you do. It's also learning how to think about what we do and why. Yeah. We're going to take a little break. We'll be back in a couple of minutes with your questions and comments, so please stay with us. some questions sounds great yes. let's start off with thomas in tennessee thomas how are you doing hello hey thomas father how are you fine thank you sir what can we do for you tonight well i had a question for father jeffrey kirby or a comment. yes sir well uh I, I guess the first thing i wanted to know if he could define what the synod on synodality means because uh, it seems like, from what I'm understanding, all of these issues that he writes about or has written about in his book are now being discussed at the Synod on Synodality. You know, such things as women in the diaconate, divorced and remarried Catholics, uh, L the tent being opened up to LBGTQ uh, people. Um, I, I guess uh, I, I was just hoping he could comment on that. Yeah, so Greg, that's a, that's a great question. And uh, I think the, you know, when I first heard of the Synod on Synodality, uh, just speaking openly, uh, I really thought it was a joke um, because it, it just seems so circular. But then, of course, the realization it's not a joke, that this really is a process that uh, the Universal Church is expected to go through. And, and I would just say, as a pastor, my first priority for the past year and continues to be to lead my parish outside of the pandemic to convince people to come back to mass. So uh, I, I don't have any uh, dog in the fight in terms of synod on synodality other than the fact that I was initially confused by it uh, because most of my work as a pastor is to get the people of God back to mass to rebuild community life, uh, to allow uh, the things of, of God, so Christian formation, the services to the poor uh, to continue to be enriched. So in terms of what's happening with the Synod on Synodality, um, you know, if it's a focus on pastoral outreach, then that always has its place. So there should be outreach to those who are in states of sin or who are away from the life of the church. Uh, if, however, it leads to any type of normalization of evil or to some type of compromise in terms of moral truth, well, as I mentioned before, and perhaps like to repeat that, uh, these things come and these things go. Sacred tradition has a great way of absorbing what is less desirable in the course of the ages. So we may have to persevere through moments of confusion, but they will pass. And what we can do is continue to go to the scriptures and the catechism of the Catholic Church and have the clarity that we need in order to persevere and to fight the good fight. Um, if I can extend the question, um, Father Mitchell, we were speaking earlier today, you give me a quote by Gary Lagrange yes. that I think would fit this question. If I can ask you for that quote. Yeah, it, it was uh, by Father, uh, Dominican Father, Reginald Gary Lagrange. The, the, he was the professor that directed Pope St. John Paul's thesis. Okay, so 
pretty, a very smart guy, very good man. And he said, we are intolerant. And I know he's bragging about that. We are intolerant in principle because we believe, but we are tolerant in action because we love. On the other hand, folks who are unbelievers are tolerant in principle because they don't believe, but they are intolerant in action because they do not love. This is one way to approach our society right now. And as Catholics, when they call us intolerant, when it comes to principle, you better believe I am. You know, this is the truth. The Ten Commandments are the truth. But I'm also tolerant in deed, in action, because I love the people who are sinners around me. I, I started hearing confessions on Skid Row in Chicago when I was a newly ordained priest, you know, and you, you love those guys, but what they do in principle is wrong. So you have to deal with those two aspects. Yeah. Whereas when you look at the so many parts of our culture that call itself progressive, they're very tolerant about principles. They let anything go. But if you disagree with them, they're intolerant in their actions because they don't love us. And that's very important to keep in mind. Let's take a question from our studio audience. Sir, where are you from? Um, Past Christiane, Mississippi. Ah, it's a nice town. That's, again, so long as there's no hurricane, it is really <laughs> a nice little town. Yeah. Um, how do you, as I say, how do you approach when you hear about diversity, inclusion, and equity in the workplace, yes. and how they they talk about oppressor and the oppress, um, pitting one race to another. Yes. Oh, yes, yes. Thank you for your question. That uh, relates uh, in, in an umbrella form of way to critical race theory, mm -hmm. which is simply because someone is a part of a race, therefore they are inherently uh, racist. And if um, they are part of a different race, then they are inherently um, the victim or the one who should be favored mm -hmm. or given privileges and so on. And of course, this is a violation of our, our most basic sense of justice, which is we judge a person based on their actions, uh, on their spoken words, not because of the color of their skin or because of their nationality or the language they might speak or the religion that they might uh, practice. Uh, so we have to be very care careful of critical theory and in our country right now, that's being applied to critical race theory. So again, this becomes a source of, of tension between neighbors. Uh, I think this whole movement that we find in terms of you know, diversity and inclusivity and equity uh, is really just a disguise in order to uh, you know, bring in critical race theory into the workplace, into neighborhoods. Uh, you know, it's interesting, you can have a neighborhood at a workplace where everyone gets along and everyone is is civil to one another and then suddenly there are these thoughts brought in and people are convinced well because you're a part of this race these other people are you know racist towards you and discriminatory towards you and because you are of this race therefore you are the aggressor and suddenly a workplace that was very peaceful and civil suddenly becomes marked by tension uh, and and deconstruction and, and same with neighborhoods so I think you have to be very careful um, this movement by the way towards this diversity and inclusivity and equity uh, has led a lot of Christians to leave certain places of work. And, and I'm waiting for businesses begin to begin to realize, wait a minute, we've lost a lot of talented, hardworking people that were committed to our company because we pushed this, right? Uh, I think what popular jargon calls this, this wokeness, right? Mm -hmm. And people are beginning to leave. And suddenly uh, these companies are going to begin to begin to experience and feel the loss of this talent and hard work because if someone's going to accept the critical race theory that becomes you know the sword they die on then most likely they're not going to be committed to a company they're not going to be committed to its mission uh, it, it's questionable in terms of the talent they have or whether you they're willing to use their talent for a particular company or enterprise so you know oftentimes what we find is once it leads to another as one virtue sings in a chorus so one but one one vice 
also demands a chorus. So you don't just find one vice, one sin. There's going to be a lot of others combined. So yeah. if you have critical race theory, then you might find a poor work ethic. You might find um, a, a desire to bring uh, tension. You might find uh, other aspects, of, uh, again, that, that are uh, morally lacking. You know? So we have to be very careful. I, I think you know, we're forgetting the, uh, one, of my, one of the heroes that, that when I was growing up, that was Martin Luther King Jr., Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. made it very clear that he wanted to live in a world, want his children to grow up in a world where people were not judged by the color of their skin, but by the quality of their character. Yes. That is a Christian principle. Yes, and, and I would argue... And it should be yes. a, a basic human principle. Absolutely. Exactly. It's, it's a Christian principle, which is the dearest to our hearts. It's an American principle. It's a principle of civilized society yeah. that you allow a person to be judged by their actions and their words, not by the color of their skin, not by uh, other factors that uh, they were born into or that are a part of them. But in terms of judgment of, of virtue or vice, justice prevails and justice is giving to another person their due. So to say, well, because you belong to this race, therefore you are the aggressor, you have done this, this is why you're doing this and so on. And no, it's a complete violation of that person's dignity and to justice. Yep. Okay, it's like, okay, if you say that, what actions or words have been done in order to justify this moral condemnation? Because if someone is a racist, they should be condemned, right? Yep. If someone is engaging in racist activity or racist word, racial word, ra racist words, uh, there, there should be some type of moral condemnation and action taken. But to simply say, well, because you belong to this race or this group of people, therefore you are guilty of this sin, no, that, that's not how moral truth works. And I guarantee anybody who follows along with that, A, they are trying to divide so as to conquer. That's one of the issues going on here. They keep people divided so they can manipulate. Yes. Secondly, they might turn on one group today, but the group that they are not turned on, oftentimes African Americans, these are the people that they had turned on in the past, and there is no principle to stop them from turning on blacks again. Mm. I wouldn't trust them if they want to turn on one group or another group. It's evil. Yes. You take and focus on the issue of character and leave it at that, and solidarity among us all. That has to be principle. Yes, yes. We have another caller. Sid? Yes. Hi, hey, you call from California, right? I am, yes. Well, great. Good Thanks to have you with us. What call. can we do for you? So as a parent um, of a uh, sophomore in high school, uh, when I was discerning a Catholic high school, which she is attending now, I was very surprised to see how the LBGTQ clubs, and questioning has permeated the Catholic high school system. And my mm -hmm. question is, is what are we to do as parents? And my choice was not to give my dollars to that particular high school. I chose one that did not have these clubs, but it has permeated the high school system, Catholic high school system. So mm -hmm. in my diocese, what can I do? Yes, so it's a, it's a great question. And, and I think, first of all, that... Um, you know, it used to be that we could trust our Catholic schools. Uh, parents could make the sacrifices in order to send their children to Catholic schools and be confident that they are receiving the faith. And in many places, that's not the case. Now, there no, are some yeah, exceptions. Yeah, too but, often, parents send uh, children to public to Catholic schools because they want a better quality education to get into college. Mm but not to live out their Catholic faith more seriously. Right, and oftentimes to that point, Father, uh, our Catholic schools, some of them, uh, will then accommodate in order to make sure that numbers stay high, to make sure that parents are happy and so on. So I think in, in the case where a parent has sent a child to a Catholic school because they want the child to receive the Catholic faith, and they begin to realize that that's not really happening, then I would say uh, appeal. Go, go to the, the principal or the headmaster. If that's not the case, then go to the <laughs> superintendent, go to the bishop. Uh, to, to, e even if the decision is to remove one's own child from the Catholic school, just to know that due diligence was done, that leadership was told. Whether they choose to act, to act or not, that will be something they answer for on judgment. 
but the fact that it was brought to their attention and they can't say I didn't know. Mm -hmm. So I think that we have a responsibility to inform leadership of what's happening. Mm -hmm. I will say with that that it's precisely because of things like this which is why we see a massive increase of homeschooling. Yeah. So Catholic parents are just saying you know what um, we're not sure exactly how this is going to work. We're going to try to rely on other uh, Catholic families that are also homeschooling. We're going to try to form some co-ops. We're going to do our best. But, you know, the souls of our children and their understanding of right and wrong is, is too valuable. So, you know, that becomes a viable option. Also, I've seen where um, in some places uh, Catholic parents have come together and formed private Catholic schools. So yes. where they have more control in terms of faculty and the mission of the school and mm -hmm. so on. So. Uh, my, my point in this is there, there are some options. Uh, the, the horizon can sometimes seem bleak, but the fact that parents are taking very seriously their responsibility, their vocation to pass on our faith and to educate their children, uh, that work will be blessed by God. And, yeah. and, and there can be solutions. I'm not saying they're going to be easy, but there are solutions. And sometimes we just have to be creative or we have to do some research and find out what's going on. The great thing with the development of technology is you can now have a homeschool co-op with seven families from five different states, right? Yeah. Yeah. You know, so you're not bound to your, ge your geography anymore. Yeah. So there, there are some options, and, and I just want to praise this, this parent that's called in because uh, I wish more of our Catholic parents would take seriously the responsibility of, of controlling and being aware of what is influencing the minds and the hearts of their children. And when you do go speak to the church leadership, you start at the lowest level. Don't write to the Pope. <laughs> right. Start right. with the principal, yes. you know, and then you go to the superintendent. Then you go to the bishop. But, you know, you start and talk to the people with the primary responsibility at the local level. That's, That's subsidiarity right. That's again. It. Exactly. Yeah. And, and very respectful. And oftentimes yes. you might find leadership more... Uh, flexible or understanding like so for example there's a LGBTQ plus club and then you know find out that oh it's actually not what it sounds like and then to just tell right. leadership maybe we should change the name to, to something else and so on so right um, exactly right. I think we, yeah. we start, find out what's yes. going on talk to the folks locally and see what you can do to help fix the situation we have another caller hello Linda hi father Padua hi you're calling from New York huh I am. Good. Yes. And what can we do for you today? I have a brother who is living with his fiance, and I did not want to totally alienate him, so I was friendly with them. I wouldn't stay overnight, but we shared some meals, and they wanted to get married, and she expressed to me she wanted the family there, and I said, well... You guys, at the very least, should get um, an annulment. And so she, I, I said, if you get the annulment, I will go. Well, it, what happened is they applied for the annulment, and I don't know if it got rejected or what, and they tried to pressure me and couldn't. And then she kind of threw a hissy fit, and I was kind of thrown out of the family, but now they want to come back together. And with the holidays coming up, I don't particularly want to go to their home, but we have relatives that we visit. And my bro I would like to see my brother. She, she said it would be fine if I go for a while. Neither one of us wanted to see each other. I'm working on mercy and forgiveness. But how, how far do I go? I mean, we exchanged Christmas gifts last year. This year I bought a plaque with the Sacred Heart of Mary. I mean, the Sacred Heart of Jesus and the Heart of Mary for the both of them. I don't want to get into too much personal stuff, but I love my brother. Yeah, of course, of yes, course. Yes. And you're supposed to love That's both right. of them. That's right. Yeah. But yes, yes, yes. So I want to answer this question, but I just want to begin by by a clarification that the answer I give in this example would be very different if I were speaking of a gay wedding. And, and the reason why there's a distinction is because a gay wedding can never become a normalized marriage. Right. So so there's very different answers in that scenario. And I just want to clarify, because one time I answered a question like this and someone said, well, you said that I said, no, no, that was a different situation, um, because when you're talking about in this situation where this married couple have the potential of becoming a normalized sacramental marriage in the life of the church. So mm -hmm. 
there, it's possible that there can be an annulment pursued. Uh, where the court caller said she's not sure whether it was declined or not. Or a lot of times people begin and then they just stop. Like, mm -hmm. I think for every uh, every percentage of those who pursue annulments, maybe ten follow the entire process through. Mm -hmm. So ten percent of, of those who begin the, the process. So here we have a situation where a marriage can be normalized, can become uh, you know a normalized, a sacralized sacral sacramental marriage. So because of that the church allows a little more flexibility. So first let's begin what we cannot do. Uh, we cannot be a part of the bridal party or the wedding party. So right. you can't be the best man, you can't be the maid of honor, you can't be you know, in, in the bridal party at all. You can't yeah. be to that level. Uh, it used to be that the church would say you could not attend the wedding at all. Now the church would say that you could attend the wedding so long as you have formally told the person that you do not support this and you've explained why. So in moral theology, we say that makes the difference between formal cooperation and material cooperation. By having the conversation with the loved one beforehand, you have left formal cooperation and entered material cooperation, which means it's acceptable. Let me give you an example because these are, terms can be perhaps overwhelming or, or confusing. Uh, we pay taxes to a government that supports abortion. Right? We don't bear moral fault for that. That's material cooperation. We're cooperating with our government that supports abortion, right? Okay, that's material cooperation. That's permitted in certain circumstances. Formal cooperation is, I give money to Planned Parenthood, is never permissible. So if someone says to their loved one, I don't support this marriage, I want you to pursue this annulment, I really want your marriage blessed in the church, they've had the conversation, they've left formal cooperation, they've entered material cooperation, which means they can attend the wedding. They cannot, again, be a part of the bridal or the wedding party, mm -hmm. but they can attend the wedding. And the church and allows that. you can't that. get one of those minister licenses over the internet and do the wedding. Right, not as a Catholic. No. Right. I, I like to tell Catholics to that point, Father, if you do that, that is formal apostasy. Yeah. Because you have not only denounced your Catholic faith, you have denounced holy orders, you've denounced the, uh, uh, the true authority of the priesthood. Right. So, so, yeah, so I, uh, in this case, one could attend a wedding, but the conversation has to happen. And the church, I want to stress this, the church allows this because it is the hope that this marriage will eventually become normalized and become fully sacramental in the life of the church. So now I will say this, <laughs> there are all these variations. Uh, I have described this to some uh, Catholic Christians who have said, Father, I understand the church permits this. In conscience, I cannot. Yeah. And I said, you have to obey your conscience. And, and there's something that you have to pay attention to. Does your attendance get constru construed as approval? And th that's an important part. Or do they know you don't approve, but you are trying to keep a bridge open that's right. for the discussion to help them to come back? Because you want to help them come back. Yes to the full life of the sacraments. Yes. So we've got to pay attention to that as that's right. well. That's right. Exactly. And, and I think that's where that conversation has to happen um, between the, you know, the person and their loved one in this situation. Right. I'll also say something that the caller indicated that I just want to highlight to, to, um, to viewers who might be in similar situations. She indicated that she would not stay overnight. Yeah. Uh, and I want to stress that it's still a discipline of the church that couples who are not married or who are not married in the church, uh, we do not stay overnight in their homes. Right. right. Father, it's gotten so weird. People ask me as their pastor to come and bless their apartment when they're cohabitating. Yeah. They really don't have a clue. It's like, no, I no. can't bless your, <laughs> your apartment, and then we have to have this awkward conversation. Yeah. That's part of it. But this is part of it. Again, I want you to uh, make sure you watch this EWTN five-part mini-series. It's well, EWTN original. It's called Living the Christian Way with Father Jeffrey Kirby, our guest tonight, and Kathy Schmoogie. It will be on EWTN November 14th to the 19th. It'll be on at 5.30 p.m. Eastern Time and 2.30 a.m. Eastern Time each day. Get a copy of it yourself on DVD by going to EWTNRC.com where it is item HDLTCW. And we'll pre-order it now, and they'll ship it out the 14th. Father, we're flat out of time. Oh, my goodness. Thank wow. you for being with okay. us. Um, again, we also want people to get your book, Living the Christian Way. Would you join me in giving a blessing? Yes. 
May Almighty God bless you and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And we can bring you Father Kirby, this new series that he's coming up with, and all the other shows only because the network is brought to you by you. So please keep us in between your gas bill, electric bill, and cable bill, and we'll pay our bills too. Thank you. Thank you.